watch Spider-Man. <laughs> I'm recording now. Oh, hey, you can just add it to the beginning. People are going to start learning how weird I am. Just in the middle, like, <laughs> we're recording and Martha's like, I like Spider-Man. Oh, I want to watch Spider-Man. I want to watch Spider-Man. I just thought of, like, the spider pig thing from The Simpsons. Movie, <laughs> and I'm like, I want to watch Spider-Man. That comment was so random. It kind of made me think of that little kid in that zoo YouTube video. I don't remember the question he was at. Like, what's your favorite amp? No. Are you having fun? And he goes, I like turtles. <laughs> Oh, no, I know which one you're talking about. Oh, God. I know exactly. Doesn't he have, like, the face yeah. paint on? Yeah, he's, like, I, I he's like, like, like a zombie or something. Yeah. I don't remember. I, yeah. I just remember, like, every time somebody says something <laughs> random, I just want to go, like, I like turtles. I like turtles. This is the greatest quote ever. So, anyway, this is the <laughs> podcast. We've been gone for a while. Like, weeks. Uh, yeah, like, a month. month. We're slackers. Okay, so we need to explain it. <laughs> Martha, like, slam something down on the table the recorder's sitting on. Just that kidding. was very gentle. I guarantee <laughs> you when you go back to listen to this, you won't hear it. So we have been... First of all, work has been busy. I, I think when the summer started, we didn't quite know what to anticipate as far as, like, how many people were actually going to come up to the North Shore. And I kind of thought it would be, like, people just canceling left and right. But that that didn't happen. I didn't know what to expect. This is my first summer working for a vacation rental. I've always worked at the beach or the pool, so it's always busy. So I knew it would be somewhat busy, but it just turned out to be an insanely busy summer. And it's definitely busier than last summer. So I wouldn't gauge this as a normal summer. It is definitely <laughs> a weird, crazy, abnormal, but still kind of a, I don't know, I had a lot of fun this summer. <laughs> well, yeah. Like I said, I'm used to being like in indoors, in a pool all summer, just like getting a few hours of sunlight after I leave. So it's this been a- has been the most productive and like busy i've been doing fun cool like activities not just yeah go to work go home go to work go home so this summer martha and i have been very busy we are going to talk a little bit about um, stand-up paddle boarding which is we kind of just picked an activity what's an activity somebody can do pretty easily on their own And even, like, purchase the thing to do it somewhat affordably, as opposed to trying to buy a canoe or trying to buy a kayak. Although you can buy kayaks for pretty cheap. In fact, we just bought an inflatable kayak, which I thought that seems like, like, like those, uh, that giant flamingo that we bought that we popped, like, a day later. (laughs) But no, this thing is actually, like, a really thick, durable, uh, nice kayak, and it was only, like, $80, $90, Wow. Yeah, I haven't used it yet, though, so I can't speak about it. However, at the same time I bought the kayak, I also purchased a stand-up pedal board. So that's kind of why we decided to focus on that particular activity, because it's both affordable and accessible to a lot of people. You don't need a lot of skill. You don't need more than one person. You can pretty much grab it and go wherever. It's kind of like mellow surfing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're on a board. Yeah, I would agree. So on today's episode, we have a two-part episode for you again. In the first part, we are going to tell you about stand-up paddleboarding on the North Shore. And then I'm going to follow that up with an interview I did with someone named Hartley Acero. And Hartley is outreach coordinator for our local medical community here in Cook County. We're recording this part on August 20th. And to date, we only, I know, right? (laughs) Right? What the heck happened this summer? Uh, We've only had six cases of COVID-19 here in Cook County. When did we get the sixth one? We got four in one week, remember? So basically, back in June, we had one case, and then that kind of came and went. And you're like, okay, one, that's pretty good. And then in July, like mid-July, we got a second case. We're like, okay, you know. We doing had a good, pretty like, good. Break between the first yeah. few cases. I think it was like three weeks. You almost forgot that we had one. And then the second case, like a week and a half later, all of a sudden we had three cases. Pretty much like one was on Thursday, one was on Friday, one was on Saturday. And then the following Tuesday, the the sixth case was announced. Which like, is a lot for here. Yeah. That seems very like minimal and that's not a big deal, but to go from one to five. 
it very quickly in yeah, quick succession. And like I said, yeah, in this small town, that's a lot. So we've been very, I, I mean, very, very lucky because we do not have the medical infrastructure that would be required if we had like a huge blow up of cases. So if we had, and none of them, as far as I know, have had to be hospitalized. Nobody has died. We've been very, 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 very lucky so far. Martha's squirming over I here. I too So much. as she's talking, she's like <laughs> rubbing her pant leg and like picking at her fingernails. So if you hear random noises, I don't know how much this will actually pick up, but you do, you I keep pointing at her to stop and that makes her do it more. Like, oh, why do you think I randomly will just dance out of nowhere? It's like a kid. You have to get your sillies out. That is still me to this day. Like, I just got to get, whoa. Get all the sillies out. So anyway, I sat down with Hartley Saro, and we did this before the mask mandate. So there's like a little section in there where we talk about when you should wear masks and where you don't have to wear masks and things. Some of that has changed based on the actual mandate that came out on July 27th, I believe it was. So yeah, there's a little section in there that is old information but it's actually mostly just advice for what you should do and in a lot of cases it's now required so just keep that in mind if you're coming from out of the state and you're not familiar with the state of minnesota mask mandate we do have one now it is still in place make sure you look it up on the you know just google minnesota state mask mandate it'll pop right up you can click it you can read it you can become familiar with where and when you are going to need a mask so just pay attention, look it up. Don't be caught surprised. I think uh, there's actually a lot of people that came from out of state who are like, oh, shoot, you guys have a mandate? I didn't know that. Luckily, we have a plethora of Visic Cook County face buffs. They invested a lot of money in these um, really cute buffs that have all the names of the different cities in Cook County on them. Oh, sure. And pretty much... Anywhere you go, people will have those, or you can buy a mask for a couple of bucks. But hey, you know, just visit, go into Visica County, or, you know, if you're a guest of a hotel or Cascade Vacation Rentals, where both Martha and I work, we have an entire box of them just sitting at our front desk. Go in, grab one, and then you have one, or two or three, whatever you feel like you will need for your trip. Just Grab it. There are plenty. Trust me. We even have a huge box in our office and nobody ever visits our office. Like our front door is even closed and we still have a huge box. So anyway, um, that is the second part of the episode. So let's kick it off with the first part as we talk about stand up paddleboarding. This is Exploring the North Shore with Martha and Jay. This podcast episode is sponsored by Cascade Vacation Rentals. They know that life has a tendency to be overwhelming at times, and busy schedules often leave people feeling overwhelmed and disconnected. That's why they're here, to offer you the space and opportunity to reconnect to what's important. Cascade Vacation Rentals has one of the largest selections of privately owned vacation rental homes and cabins on Minnesota's North Shore of Lake Superior, from Duluth to the Canadian border. Their team is there to help you and your family or small group enjoy a vacation you'll remember for years to come. Visit them online at www.cascadevacationrentals.com. And don't forget to use promo code PODCAST for the largest percent off discount available at any given time. Again, that's www.cascadevacationrentals.com. I can't be still. And we also don't have a fancy podcasting setup because we do a lot of our let's podcasting. Let's just get a closet. We should get a closet. Well, we just... Let's make the rave corner. Let's put like a... <laughs> make... Oh, okay. Hold put on. A, wait, wait. Put a big box and we like can go paint into it. the box. Yes. Like a, like a clubhouse. The podcast clubhouse. So Martha and I share an office <laughs> in an office building in Grand Marais. If you're familiar with grammar, it's behind the holiday. And so she's in one room and I'm in another room and there's a door between us. But in her little office space, there's like this empty corner and we've been debating what to do with it. So we jokingly say we're going to put the right like corner. strobe light yeah. and music. Get the, the strip lights out of like sync with the music and it'll be like the rave corner. Like rave when you corner. need a break from your computer, just Go in the corner and dance. So this is what we do all day, everybody. This is our job. Or lay on the floor <laughs> with Eeyore. Yes, Eeyore the pillow pad that you forgot to take on our Boundary Waters trip. 
So on to today's topic. Uh, the reason I picked stand up paddle boarding was so long story short, I had saved up a ton of money to buy myself a solo canoe because I was all like, I'm going to go on a solo Boundary Waters trip this summer. I'm still planning this. Uh, if I can find a permit that works for where I want to go in at, I will still be doing a Boundary Waters trip. However, permits are very limited and I am the idiot who did not plan ahead and purchase one wow. sooner. Barb's going right? to be disappointed. Barb is super disappointed in me and I did not, I was not like Barb and now I, I have to wait for people to cancel permits. Barb is on top of me yeah. on, um, on my next Boundary Waters trip. <laughs> so we, I, I have not done that. But anyway, I, I was saving up all this money because I wanted to buy a really nice one when we were down we were supposed to be at this uh, conf- or convention. I don't know. Like a, I don't know. Canoe Copia. It's in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, Martha yeah. and I were supposed to go down there. I think it was like March 16th or something like that. That's about when the right date before, of it was. Right before everything got crazy. But it was like during the time everything got crazy. And we made the call kind of the day before to not go down. So I did not go down there. I did not get to lift up and feel and experience uh, canoes that were on the convention floor, which was what my plan was. So I, I kind of kept the money set off to the side and was just trying to find like canoes. I, mean, I really wanted just a lightweight solo canoe, something I can carry myself without any problems. I couldn't find one and I didn't want to buy one without seeing and feeling it first. So I ended up being convinced by actually Carl Madsen from Rockwood, who you met a couple of episodes ago. He convinced me to just rent one because he's like, it's not worth it to buy it. Trust me, the few times you'll use it, you can just rent it. If you find you use it more, then go out and buy one. Rent from us. You know, they're my neighbors. So uh, they're, they're, they're pretty convenient for me. So yeah, I decided to not buy the canoe. So I had all this money and I'm like, well, I still want something because we now have a house that's on a lake. Well, we don't. There's no house on it. We have a property on the lake that we're going to put a house on. And we have a dock. So I'm like, I need something. So I thought about a kayak. I thought about one of those giant foam mat things. And eventually I got turned on to stand-up paddleboarding from a friend who said they're pretty affordable. You can get them for, like, you can get the foam ones. Probably between $300 for a super cheap one upward to like $1,500. So you can go really high end with them. (laughs) Uh, The ones we had here in town that I went to look at was $550, which is pretty affordable because that was way less than I was planning to spend on a canoe. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Well, as I started researching it more, I discovered the inflatable stand-up paddle boards. And I liked that because they fold out really, really small, not like tiny. I mean, they're still three and a half feet high and it's not bad. weighs it's like 50 portable. pounds, but it's portable. And they, you know, they come with carrying cases. So you put them in a backpack, the the paddles condense down really small and then they click together to get bigger. And, you know, it, it's a very portable option, which is nice for if you don't have a lot of space. And especially if you don't want to like strap this giant board to the roof of your car to drive places. So I ended up going with a inflatable paddleboard. I spent probably three weeks on Amazon researching stand-up paddleboards. And as soon as I started researching on Amazon, of course, every single Facebook ad I got was about <laughs> paddleboards. So I was inundated and it took me a really long time to finally pick one. I I was eyeing this one that I, I liked mostly because it was pretty, but it was also wider than most. And it was meant for yoga. More yeah, I was going to say, isn't yours technically one that's supposed to be for yoga? Yeah. Still works the same. It's like called the P6. I can't remember who makes it, but it's it was meant to be for yoga. And it was like $450. I'm like, that's a little expensive, but whatever. And then all of a sudden one day... I went on to Amazon and I was going through my favorited items and I noticed that one had dropped down to $270. I was like, this That's can't be bad. real. And I'm like reading the reviews thinking they must be awful if it's that cheap. But everybody was saying it was really nice and it had everything you need. So for $270, I purchased a stand-up paddleboard. I have now had it and I've used it probably half a dozen times or more, like probably 10 times since then. And I love it. 
Martha and I took it out for the first time on Seagull Lake back in July. And here's another thing about this crazy summer. Usually when we have a podcast episode, there's an article that goes along with it and a video that goes along with it and pictures that go along with it. I have all of this completely unedited because I have been so insanely busy. I have not been able to edit it. So this particular one will have a companion article someday on exploringnorthshore.com. But for right now, you know, you're just getting the podcast episode and then that will probably come next week. We just want to get this edited and out. Yeah, we brought it out to Seagull and at the time we just had the little pump inflator that, like the pump <laughs> that came with it. That was quite an event. So Martha, I actually Arms did just a... just get so tired. Yes. Like you're not thinking about it. You're just going. You get like a couple minutes in, you're like, oh God. It's not like it's that big of a thing. It's just you have to pump a lot of air in it to make it solid. And it's inflatable and it's made with this like rubbery material. And you just you don't realize how much air you have to force into it to get it up yep. to the like, PSI. Especially, yeah, especially once you get to like the last two getting it. You're like, I'm at 10 PSI and I only have to get to 12 and it's so hard. It takes hard. forever. So I have a time lapse video of the two of us trading doing off. this. Your turn, my turn. And I figured out very, very quickly that using the, you know, the pump that came with it is probably only something I would use if I was somewhere without a vehicle or electricity where I can't use my electric one because I ended up picking up an electric pump and that thing is great. I got one that, you know, you set it to a certain PSI, so I'll set it to 12.5. You turn it on and you just walk away. And once it hits 12.5, it turns itself off. And then you just take it off and you screw it on. But even with the electric one, it still takes like five minutes to inflate it. Mm -hmm. And I think with the two of us doing the manual one, it was like 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. We got it inflated. It was really windy that day, too. So we only pedaled around the... Mm, weird windy though like you were in what'd you call that a little harbor almost like a little inlet, little, mini, little bay yeah, yeah as soon as you got out of the way of the trees it was huge current and you're just like oh guess i'm going that way like not as bad as when we were in the boundary waters but like <laughs> it's still just the minute you hit that spot your the paddle board would just be like oh turning that way time to go so we did not do a lot of paddleboard that day but it was fun we just kind of tootled around that little bay area by the boat launch and had fun and I attempted to do a headstand and I got I got like my knees on my elbows and my head down and like one foot part way up and that was it was yeah you did some yoga I did some yoga some downward dog and child's yeah. pose mm -hmm. just testing it out we had a little bit of fun and what I figured out from that is the inflatable paddle boards are great and really solid. Like you you wouldn't and realize much lighter. You have two choices basically on what the board is made of. So the inflatable paddle boards are like this flexible rubbery material. And then if you get a solid one that is made out of foam surrounded by fiberglass. And they do. So most of them have that grippy part on the top mm -hmm. too, just to kind of Keep, so you don't slide off. Yeah. So you can Because once stand, they get wet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're meant to get wet, guys. <laughs> That's kind of the point of them. And, and then there's different lengths, too. So if you if you are renting a stand-up paddleboard, usually you'll go into the place and then be like, okay, this is the board we recommend for you. And, you know, you don't really have to know too much. So if you end up going to Duluth the SUP or if you end up going to Stone Harbor and doing anything, they're going to provide you with a paddleboard. But if you feel like buying one, there are a few things you should know about picking out the perfect paddleboard. Uh, to start, pick what kind of material you want it made out of. Now, obviously the solid ones have their pros too. They're, I think, I don't, I think they last a little bit longer. Although I've also heard that once they get dinged up, like if you accidentally drop it and you get a dent, it, there's no removing the dent. That's true. Yep. But on the stand-up paddleboard, if you like nick a rock that's really sharp and you put a hole into it, that's pretty much also the end of it. Although there are patch kits and I have not had to patch mine yet. So like I said, I've used it like 10 times pretty. Um, we'll get into one situation where we were kind of rough with it and you're looking confused. It's at camp. We had like 10 kids on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
The other thing to think about is the width. So longer, shorter, wider. I ended up with a 10 inch board or a 10 foot board that is 35 inches wide and 35 inches is pretty wide for a board. Usually they're between 30 and 36. And usually the wider they are, the longer they are. So if you get a longer one, you're like a 12 foot board, you might have a 36 inch width. I ended up going with wider again because I wanted one that was more meant for yoga. Wider is also more stable, but it also makes it harder to kind of maneuver and control it. The length more has to do with like the 10 foot ones. And there's another reason I went for a 10 foot board. You do not have to register a 10 foot board in Minnesota but you do have to register a board if it's longer than 10 feet. If you're not in Minnesota and you're thinking of getting a pedal board, look up your state's rules for what you have to register as far, to, as far as watercraft goes. Outside of 10 feet, so if something's like 11 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet, you are going to have to register that in Minnesota. It only costs like, don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's like $30 a year. So it's not that much, but it adds to it. So when I was shopping for one, I was like, I wanted to stick to 10 feet. 10 feet tends to be considered short and is considered good for kids. However, I'm kind of a smaller adult, so I think 10 feet will be sufficient for me. But you've also been on it yeah. and have had no problem. I've gone on it with my kids. You can get longer ones, so between 10 and 12 feet is considered medium and between like 12 feet and 14 feet is considered long. They're good for different things. You know, the 10 to 12 feet is kind of the all around. The 12 to 14 feet is a lot faster and it's good for if you want to go long distances. So believe it or not, people actually take stand up paddle boards into the boundary waters. Can I believe it? Yeah. But uh, my only concern would be all my stuff. Like I'm sure you have waterproof things to put your stuff in if you get hit by a wave the wrong way and that just like sends you toppling over the same thing could be said for a canoe though yeah i just feel more secure in a canoe <laughs> than i would on a paddle board yeah. with all my junk but then again you're one person and you're probably not going to have a whole lot bringing a paddle board you're pretty much probably going very minimal yeah with what you're bringing my board doesn't have the there's usually these like elastic cords mm -hmm. in the front that you can put your stuff and like yeah. attach your stuff to the board yeah. so it's more secure. It's not just loose. Mm -hmm. Mine doesn't have that because again, I got a board that was more meant for doing yoga and not meant for trips into the boundary waters. But if you do want to do a boundary waters trip with a stand up paddle board, uh, Rockwood, I I we brought up Rockwood a lot, but it's just because I'm really familiar. They got some gray duck brand paddle oh, boards. Oh yeah, He's, he yeah. brought that up while we were there last time. So yeah, you can you can totally rent a paddle board if that's how you want to go, if you don't want to do uh, a canoe. Now I've done paddle boarding in different ways where I've been standing up and I've also done like paddle around kneeling down and even just sitting down. And that's kind of what I like about it is you can adjust yourself as mm -hmm. you need to if you are going long distances. It's not always fun to just sit the whole time. So on a stand up paddle board, you can stand up. And if you get tired, you can kneel down or sit down. You can also get chair attachments for them that attach to the D rings on the side. So they have a chair. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. So they're super flexible. They're super, you know, customizable for what you want. There's even a brand I saw that has a chair that is elevated up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting down almost at stand, like at chair height, normal yeah. chair height. So you're, you're still paddling the height. But for that kind of thing, you're going to want the longer board as well as a narrower board. So as far mm -hmm. as the width of a board goes, they range from about 25 inches up to, like I said before, 36 inches. Mine is a 10 foot 35, so it's kind of short and stout, but again, meant for yoga. If you want it more for going a long distance travel, you want long and narrow because it's just a lot faster. It's easier to maneuver. It's a little more easy to control, especially in waves. So if you can't control, like I take my board out if it's a nice calm day. I do not take my board out if it's a windier day, just because it's not really meant for that. The other thing to think about when you're looking at a stand-up paddle board is the thickness of the board. And it ranges from four inches to eight inches with like five or six inches being kind of the average, yeah. I think. Again, it has to do with 
how much I think that, that the the width has more to do with how much weight it can hold as well as um, how sturdy I get like sturdy is like the thicker it is the sturdier it is but at the same time I've heard that if you go too thick like eight inches is just kind of ridiculous and it's very difficult to maneuver a board that thick so I went with a six inch board and that just kind of I, I came across a few that were four and a few that were five, but pretty much every board I looked at was six inches. So I didn't put a whole lot of consideration into the thickness of the board because six just kind of seemed to be the standard easiest to obtain, I guess. If you wanted to get a different thickness, it was a little more of like a special well, yeah. order like type I said, thing. You, even though yours is a yoga one, yours is the standard. Yeah, pretty the standard. size and the thickness. Uh, there's also a different in what kind of fins that you can have. So some of them had just a single fin and this tends to be better for things like surfing or if you're going to be, I guess I've heard it's good for better for like racing and going really fast. Whereas a three fin is better for controlling, just kind of staying stable and like I want to go straight. I ended up buying one with three fins just because... It had it, and like I said, I got a really good deal on mine. I kind it's of like found the two little ones in the big one. Yeah, right? so the yeah. two fins on the side, and then a big one in the middle. The big one in the middle you can remove. As far as I could tell, the budget ones seem to have a single fin, and the higher priced ones, like the better quality ones, seem to have the three. So the three seems to be kind of the better option. I'm sure if I was ever going to become like a stand-up paddleboard racer or if I was going to be like Jared Munch and I was going to paddleboard from Duluth to the Arctic Circle or whatever he did, I would definitely focus more on figuring out the differences between those things. But for the average user, and if you're just going to go out and buy one, I really don't think that you're going to notice or care about the number of fins so much. You know, so if you, if you just want to buy... If you're in Minnesota, you don't want to have to register it. Probably the best thing to do is look for a board that is 10 feet. Again, if you go longer than 10 feet, you will have to register it. Um, and with between like 32 and 34 inches, and then the thickness would be about six inches. And one fin or three fins, I really don't think it matters that much. Just look more at what you want as far as you know, how it looks, how much it weighs, things like that. And the other thing to think about is I mentioned before how you can customize some of these by attaching things to the D-rings. That was one thing that was really important to me. I'm like, okay, I want two sets of D-rings, one in the front, one in the back, so I can attach things to there if I want. Basically, those are those little metal D things that you can clip stuff into. My board does not have an ankle, like an ankle cord. Yeah, yours doesn't. And there's a reason for that. At first it was like, oh, I have to get one that has like an ankle cord. I have to, because if you fall off, your board like flies off in one direction, you fly off in another direction, you then have to chase your board down. But if it's attached to you, it's attached to you. It's not going to go very far. You just have to like pull it back. But I read one review for a different board that said they got a hole in it and it deflated while it was still attached to their ankle. Oh, yeah, no. and they're like, well, thank goodness we're wearing a life jacket, which you should absolutely always wear a life jacket, even on a stand-up hellboard. But they're like, yeah, we are like scrambling to detach this thing. It was like I never thought about yeah. that. I've never had an inflatable one, so um, right. I've always done it on like the solid ones. Mm -hmm. That there's no way that's gonna sink. <laughs> so since I decided to go inflatable, I decided that the ankle. Thing was not a priority for me so I didn't I didn't get one it has not ever been an issue but if you're gonna get a solid board for the most part they come with those so you can attach it to your ankle just like if you you know if, if you're a surfer or if you've ever gone surfing or if you've ever watched a movie about surfing they're always wearing those because if your board flies in one direction you fly in the other at least you don't have to swim to catch it and people on the shore are laughing at you <laughs> and if you're if you're paddle boarding someplace like Lake Superior in that case, I would absolutely wear yes. that because it is cold and you do not want to be having to swim very far to get back onto drier land. More or less, we're bringing this up because it's something you can purchase and bring and have and not have to go someplace and rent or not have to go on a tour or anything like that. You have it. It's yours. It's, quote, safe, you know. Um, 
for you to use. Again, you have to wear a life jacket. That is a Minnesota law. Technically, the law is that the life jacket has to be with you. With you you yeah. don't actually have to be wearing it. So you could just have it sitting on the board itself. But I would recommend just wearing it because you never know what's going to happen. Anything could happen at any time. And it's better to be safe than sorry. So just wear your life jacket. They do make life jackets that are a little more flexible. I, or like, If you're going to do, be doing yoga and things like that, they have life jackets that aren't so bulky and kind of easier to wear for that. So we have taken the board a few different places. And again, it packs up nice and small. So the first place we took it was Seagull Lake up on the Gunflint Trail. The second place was Popular Lake on the Gunflint Trail. And then a couple of weeks ago, Martha and I, because we are family, I don't know if anybody's aware of this, not <laughs> by blood or any sort of legality, but we're family now. We also went to the same summer camp. We've talked about that a few times. We had the opportunity to actually rent out the summer camp for just our family one week. And we decided to do that. And we're like, yeah, that's, you know, it's like we can rule camp. Heck yeah. So we spent a wonderful five days at YMCA Camp Miller in Sturgeon Lake. And we definitely brought the paddle board. And I, you know, I've taken it where I put, I've got two daughters and I've thrown my girls on the board. There was one point where I had all three of my kids. So my two daughters and my son on the board and we've been paddling around. And then when we were at camp, we had, so it was our oh, family <laughs> and it was actually another friend came with his two kids five adults and five children. Am I doing the math right? Two, yes. Five adults, three. five children. Well, I guess I could be counted as a child. You could be. I that certainly is. had no responsibility while you we look were at, there. If you look at the pictures, <laughs> there's pictures of the kids and you're like always in it. Yep. And then there's pictures of the adults and you're never there. I'm in... A co- uh, you're in the you're, we were playing board games that night. Oh yeah, that's the only like adult picture adult. I'm in, or I'm just like with the kids all all the time. Being all. a kid, yeah, dude. I had to re-experience camp. I hadn't been there, and I think we figured out ten years. Crazy. That's way too long to go, right? So we we <laughs> did bring the board, and at one point we had like all five kids standing on the board, basically trying to outlast each other, <laughs> like king of the hill. Yes. <laughs> And yeah, and so they're like pushing each other off. And I can't remember, there's this picture and I wish I could remember what he said, but Bear, my son, was the first one to fly off. And the picture is the, you and me. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know. Did he say anything or did he just get on and then just like. No, he definitely, he said something because he was trying to stay on. And as he jumped off, he yelled out something hilarious. Because if you look at our faces, and again, this will all go in the post when I get it done. It's a good If you look at our faces, of pictures. we are cracking up. So whatever he said was really funny. But now, of course, I can't Shocker reflect back. Shocker bear said something hilarious. Right. It's just kind of his <laughs> thing. So it's, it's fun for just a single adult taking it on. We've had two adults on it. We've had an adult and three kids. We've had five kids playing king of the hill basically like who can (laughs) stay on the longest it's just it's a fun thing to have and we've definitely when all five kids were on it and investment yeah they were not being gentle with it we were like like i said i beached myself actually i was there i was trying to like get back really quick and then just end up paddling myself right onto the shoreline Mm -hmm. and they're sturdy yeah it was sturdy it was fun the kids had fun with it. The other adults took it out. It's just one of those affordable, easy, portable things that you can have to make your time at the lake way more fun. You can paddleboard on Lake Superior. I would highly recommend you pick one of those days where the water is Very like calm. crystal calm. Like yes. you can see all the way down to the bottom and it's just very glass like Mm -hmm. i would not take it out in waves you can surf on lake superior and we might do a surfing episode this winter that is something you can do more in november and it requires a full wetsuit the winter storms are the best for surfing because they create the biggest waves with all that wind I found two places i'm sure there are more and i do apologize to the other places that 
let you rent them out. Well, actually, I can think of three. So let me tell you about three places. So the first one is Stone Harbor Wilderness Supply right here in downtown Grimmere. They actually have stand-up paddleboard tours. They are $55 per person. You basically learn the you know, the ins and out, the basics of stand-up paddleboarding, and then you do the tour in the Grand Ray Harbor. So that's the area past the break wall where all the boats are. So sometimes you'll go downtown and you'll look out there and there's people on stand-up paddleboards out there. I know some people who have done paddleboarding at Five Mile Rock. So there's a little beach just um, east of Grand Ray, about five miles, <laughs> because <laughs> the rock is... Five miles away. Yeah, I asked yeah. that question once, and somebody told me, and I was like, well, Just duh. kidding. Why did I even ask that question? The rock is not five miles from shore. The rock is five miles That's from Grand Ray. I originally <laughs> thought, and then someone's like, because it's five miles out of town, and I was like, well, dang. Sat there, just blank, like, wow, Martha. You Good really never job. connected those two. <laughs> So you can do it there. I mean, really any of the beaches on a nice calm day. Of course, inland lakes, you can launch yourself from any of the public boat landings and just tootle around a lake and have some fun. If you are renting a house on a lake, take your board out. If you're staying at some of the cabins like at Gunflint Lodge or at Rockwood or at Big Bear or at any of the other multiple like Hungry Jack Lodge, bring your paddleboard, shoot it out there. Now, some of those places actually do have boards for rent as well. So call ahead and be like, hey, I really want to try stand up paddleboarding. Do you rent paddleboards to your guests? Rockwood, like I said before, they do. They actually not only rent them to their guests to experience like out on the lake, but you can rent them to take into the boundary waters. And I actually do want to do it someday. I wouldn't do it on my personal board. I would rent the board from Rockwood. I just, I won't do it this year. I'm going to get used to, <laughs> I'm going to do my solo in a canoe. Or maybe a kayak. I'll probably do my solo in my kayak because I have it. But anyway, that's getting off the subject. Um, they also do stand-up paddleboard yoga through Stone Harbor during the North Shore Water Festival, which I believe happens in July. And I think they actually did have it this year. Really? So, yeah, I think they did because it's it's all stuff you do on water, which is kind of in itself a social distancing activity. Because if you're going to go out and by yourself on a board, mm -hmm. if you're on a kayak, you're by yourself in your kayak. If you're in a canoe, you're probably with your family member in the canoe. That is true. And even if you're going out with friends on your separate boats, you're usually 10, 15 feet away from each other. You're not right next to each other. So it's a good activity to do with other people, too, as long as you remember the general rules when you're on land and when you are closer to each other on Water. Again, you don't want to wear a mask on water because you don't want to wear a mask in an activity where the mask could get wet. So that's one of the exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everybody could see the like, you know, the, the kombucha girl where she goes the meme of her like the gross face and then she's like, meh, that was just me. But like, why would you not wear a mask in the water? And then. Oh, yeah, you'd be, like, <laughs> waterboarding yourself if the water got in there. So don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that, yeah, that's dangerous. I, I guess I can see where that's not a good thing. They actually specify that in the state of Minnesota, like, website, like, when not to wear, like, when doing an activity where it could get wet. Oh, yeah, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> the other place that you can rent a stand-up paddleboard is a website called Duluth SUP, and they have some different things that you can do. They have paddleboarding to the Wisconsin Point Lighthouse. You can have paddleboard parties. You can go and do paddleboard yoga. There's like sunset paddleboards and and full moon paddleboarding. It's oh my right. God. Can we? I know. I want to do that. I wanted to do that for <laughs> this episode. That's kind of why this episode kept getting delayed. Is because we were actually trying to go someplace and rent and do like a tour and interview the person who was doing the tour. But like a lot of things this summer, we got insanely busy and just did not have the... This is the summer of the COVID. Summer of the COVID, where we are both not hanging up, hanging around people, and also extremely busy. Too, too busy to do fun things, but not busy enough to not do fun things. Exactly. So we just kind of turned it into a, how can you go paddleboarding and stay safe and be by yourself or with just your family and just a general guide for how to 
buy a paddle board if you're going to buy one. Um, again, you can rent paddle boards if you don't want to buy one. There's various places to do that, and they're becoming more and more popular. In fact, I think it's, I, I remember seeing paddle boarding for the first time like three years ago. And I, I taught it. feel like it's blowing up. While. This is like the baby shark song. I've been doing it for a while now, and it's just now getting popular. Everybody else is catching up. Martha <laughs> yes. was ahead of the curve. And working at the beach house, I'm not sure if they still rent them with everything going on, but this is another option if they start it up again. You can rent them for $15 an hour at the beach house in Park Point. So I would do a lot of those. And working out there, we got to just do it for free. Cough, cough. <laughs> <laughs> so before my shift at the beach house, sometimes I would just go out and paddleboard or after my shift, if it was a crazy day and I'm like, I just need to go out on the water, I would close up the beach house and go paddleboard for a little bit. So you have options. There are ways to experience it. You can purchase one, rent one, do a tour, go out on your own. So many options. That's why it's kind of cool because it's a, it's a little more accessible, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's becoming more and more accessible. accessible. So... Options, things to do, ways to have fun by yourself safely. So this wraps up the stand-up paddleboard session. And now we're going to hop over to my interview with Hartley Acero. Again, she is the outreach coordinator for our medical, medical community up here in Cook County, where we discuss, uh, mostly we're discussing masks, but um, it, it's, it's more about how you can stay safe and be outside and enjoying the North Shore during COVID-19, which has kind of been the running theme of all of our episodes this year. I know it's a, kind of a topic people are getting a little burnt out from hearing. But it's not it's going anywhere. It's so important. So. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's a Come prepared. Life. Listen to this great interview. Hartley is amazing. It was so much fun to sit down with another human being outside of work and home and be able to talk. So we did this interview in her garden. It was very lovely. And now I'm going to cut over. And again, this was recorded in mid-July before the mask mandate. So some things have changed. Do your research. Come prepared. Be like Barb. Exploring the North Shore is sponsored by The Big Lake. The Big Lake is an approachable art gallery and gift shop located in the beautiful harbor town of Grand Marais, Minnesota, as well as online at thebiglakelife.com. The Big Lake provides a beautifully curated and fun shopping experience to complement your North Shore adventures with artists and products that reflect the culture, values, allure, and lifestyle of the North Shore. Shop online at www.thebiglakelife.com and use promo code EXPLORE for 15% off your first online order. Uh, so everyone, we are here today with Hartley Acero. And why don't you tell us what you do? I am the outreach coordinator for Sawtooth Mountain Clinic. Okay, and so for anybody who doesn't know, the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic is pretty, it's the only clinic in Cook County. Oh, well, there's a, Grand Portage has yeah. their own clinic, but but we are the only game in town. Yep, for and Grand then, Marais. you know, from pretty much everywhere from Schroeder on up, you know, that's yeah. that's who you, you cover. There's a clinic in Silver Bay, and that's... That is true. So... Um, once again, we are outside recording this. You might hear, so I hear some bird noises, which is quite pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of wind today, so hopefully that won't be an issue. We are also, of course, wearing masks. So if anything sounds muffled, that's why. But, you know, that's, that's life right now. It is. And we're here today to talk about basically how to interact in nature, I guess, is and right now, that's a question on a lot of people's minds, especially since we cover, you know, we're an outdoor adventure podcast. Mm -hmm. So how can we enjoy the great outdoors? So my, my first question is, is actually what scenario is most likely to result in contracting COVID-19? Like, can you catch it just by passing someone on the street or perhaps a hiking trail? Well, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. And so that means that it infects you when somebody exhales respiratory droplets that are infected and then somehow those droplets get into your nose or mouth so this can happen when you either inhale what someone has exhaled or if you touch something that's covered in their infected droplets and then you touch your face and it gets in your nose that way so the 
in talking about can you just catch it by walking by someone, that really doesn't meet the, let's say that there's maybe four variables that we need to think about when we think about could I get infected in this in this scenario. And those the things that either increase or decrease your risk of coming into contact with the virus are space, airflow, time, and people. So let's think about space first. How much space is around you is what that means. Are you inside in a room or are you outside in, uh, in the open air? The next one would be airflow. How much air is actually moving by you? Are you inside a room where the air is pretty still and, and limited or are you outside where there's an actual breeze? Time is the other big one. How long are you in a space with someone that has the virus? And then lastly, people. How many people are nearby? How close are those people to you? And are they wearing face coverings? The more people you're around, the greater chance that there's gonna be somebody in that group that's infected and exhaling those droplets. So if we take um, the example of walking past somebody on the street or on a hiking trail, and then we apply those four measures to them, Say you're walking down the street in Grand Marais. Well, it could, we know that sometimes it's really crowded. Mm -hmm. And we know that sometimes you can have all of Wisconsin to yourself. So there, that, that can vary. Sometimes we got a nice breeze coming in off the lake. Sometimes it's absolutely still. Sometimes you're window shopping and you spend a great deal of time outside of Sievertson's looking at all the beautiful <laughs> things in the gallery. Sometimes you are hooking it to the donut shop and you're on a mission, so you're moving pretty quickly. Sometimes the people around you will be masked and sometimes they won't. So it's, you know, there's, there's, we have to take, we have to assess the situation mm -hmm. when we go in. Now hiking, a little bit different story. There's, you're much more likely to, to have fewer people. Um, you're, you are by the very nature of the activity on the move. Mm -hmm. um, um, and you might encounter people that are mastered that are not, but you're not going to be hanging around up in their face. So unfortunately, the, the most likely scenario for transmission is probably the one that we want to think about the least. It might not, and it may or may not have much to do with adventuring, it's actually being around our friends and family. Yeah. I was gonna so. say that you're most likely to catch it from someone you know, rather mm -hmm. than a stranger on the street. Yeah, because we, we just don't think about it. We tend to underestimate the risk that our, our loved ones pose. Um, we just have this innate, this innate feeling that I care about this person, this person cares about me. How can, how can something bad mm -hmm. come of that? But um, you know, my daughter is a waitress in the cities and it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much I love her. It doesn't matter how much I miss her. It doesn't matter that she is a um, competent person who is taking great care um, to, to be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. She's a risk. So adventuring here feels a little different. It's a bit, this is a, um, this is a loaded question in some yeah. ways. Yeah, yep. Kind yeah. of, um, I, almost every question on the topic, it's hard to really like give a definite answer because there is so many variables that you have to consider. Uh, one time we were hiking on Honeymoon Bluff up on the Gunflint Trail mm -hmm. and it was just myself and Martha, who's my co-host, walking pretty much in circles. And then we came down and we walked past another group that was coming up and, and, and walked kind of right past them on the trail. And it took me a second to be like, oh, we probably shouldn't have done that. We probably should have like backed off and mm -hmm. got into like, mm -hmm. a, you know, stepped aside, let them pass. And then we carry on. We just sort of passed each other. We all said hello. And I'm like, well, yeah. that was another problem. We probably shouldn't have said hello. It's, it's hard to 
bypass that Minnesota nice. Yeah, and there's we're having to think about so many little things that we just ran on autopilot yeah. before. And so how do you interrupt that flow a uh, hundred times a day? Um, it, 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 it gets really emotionally and intellectually fatiguing to have to constantly mm -hmm. be on your guard. Um, and that's part of, I know that the, the shelter in place, the stay at home is a, it can be a real pain, but it, in some ways it's also, at least you don't have to think so hard all mm. the time. You're just here and you can, I can breathe on my son. I can stand next to my husband and I don't have to think about it. Yeah, I actually just read an article today about how for a lot of people, stay at home is a lot less stressful than returning kind of to society has been for them for yeah. those reasons. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what popular North, I mean, it's summertime, it yeah. is beautiful. And we have had a oddly very warm, dry summer. So mm -hmm. people are really wanting to get out. Yep. So what sort of summertime activities have a lower risk? So if, you know, we... I think a continuum is a, is, a, is a good way to think about this. So the lowest risk on that end of the continuum is going to be anything that is outside with people in your household. So um, this last weekend we went kayaking. There were some other people in a boat way on the other side of the <laughs> lake. Bunch of air in between us and them. That's about as low risk as it can get. A little higher risk, we're going to move along that continuum a little bit, and that's going to be outside with people that aren't part of your household, but you are six feet apart and you are wearing masks. So this is going to be things like kayaking with friends or going fishing or golfing's a little harder mm -hmm. if you're, you know, you can't do the cart, the riding together in a golf cart anymore. The highest risk is going to be anything that's inside with people that are not part of your household, especially if you are not masked. Mm -hmm. That's now, you know, when you go back to those, um, those four measures that I talked about earlier, space, airflow, time, and people, now we're really moving into the, into the danger zone because we're ticking off every one of those. Um, so that would be, Going to, going to a friend's house um, and hanging out in the living room versus on in the yard. Mm. Um, lingering in stores up close to other people. <laughs> and that is such a hard thing for us. I just, I have not actually gone into a grocery store since March, but I remember like when I would go into the grocery store, almost guaranteed you'd run into somebody you know. This is a very, very oh, small yeah. town. We know, most of us know each other. And you end up chatting in the oh, aisle yeah. and there's like two or three people kind of try to, you know, they're, squ they're like, okay, squeeze past you. Like, oh, go right ahead. Uh -huh. And it's just, it's strange to think that that, that culture of let's just hang out and chat in the middle of the grocery store isn't really something that's happening right now. Yeah. It's, it's part of what makes life nice here, you know, is the, um, the, the connectivity. And that's part of what makes life nice everywhere. <laughs> Uh, and when we can't, we can't just do that so easily, it, it really, it, it feels like a little bit of the richness is gone away. Um, restaurants, you know, sitting inside restaurants, that's another thing that, that moves you down towards the end of the, um, in the danger zone. If you're sitting at a table next to someone else, even though you, it feels like that person is at their table. I am at my table, but um, if you're within six feet of each other for any length of time, it's it's not as uh, innocuous a situation yeah. as it might seem. If I'm, say, out jogging and if I'm by myself mm -hmm. or if I'm hiking by myself, would you recommend wearing a mask or would that be something that it's okay? Like if I'm jogging, and again, this is different than in the cities. When you're up here, you might be jogging along Highway 61 and not see another jogger. Exactly. You might be hiking on, I mean, if you go to, I would say, uh, Gooseberry or Jay Cook or Split Rock, you're going to mm -hmm. be interacting with people. But if I'm hiking at, um, say, 
uh, Crosby Manitou State Park where there's a lot lower people Mm -hmm. and I'm by myself or with my immediate family, Mm -hmm. would you recommend still wearing a mask or is that okay to do an activity without a mask on? The, the CDC recommends that, that if you're doing a high intensity activity, masking makes, makes breathing really difficult. If you're, if you're running or hiking hard uphill, that kind of thing. So the, you don't have to mask if, <laughs> and then there's the big if, mm-hmm. if there's not other people around you, you know, if you're alone, then certainly. What what would probably be a, a good compromise is to have your mask around your neck, do your activity, breathe as hard as you need to breathe. And then if someone is coming down the, the hiking trail towards you, hit the pause, just lift hike your, it up real quick. Yeah, <laughs> hike up your mask while you're hiking, and then go on about your business. Everything, everything comes back down to how, how much airflow, how close, for how long. Yep. So. And you never know when you head out. Um, there might be you might think it's going to be really quiet yeah. that day, and you get there, and there's a lot of people. Yeah. So just wear your mask around your neck, and you're covered, literally. And a, a big term flying around right now is contact tracing Mm -hmm. and um what happens when somebody tests positive is they contact the people who may have been in close contact with them Mm -hmm. that are considered a contact now with something like i went hiking at gooseberry on june 15 at noon and touched a handrail is that included in contact tracing like do you have to seek out all those people who were there no what they're going to be the the contact tracer will help someone recreate what happened in the the days before they were tested or they started feeling sick and and so not every little when we say contact we don't mean like my hand contacted the handrail that's not that kind of contact it means what person was i within six feet of for more than 15 minutes because that's the that's the majority of transmission right there as happens in with those two variables so a contact tracer helps a person to identify all right this is who this is who i chatted with in the grocery store um about how to choose a cantaloupe um but not i touched something somewhere so that's the and the, it's the also the type of contact and the and a sick person's symptoms they also matter too so for instance say you just passed someone in a in a hallway or a grocery store aisle that doesn't count that's less risk mm-hmm. than say we're actually talking to each other about this cantaloupe and you start coughing and you're within a couple of feet of me that's a very different situation. So the contact um, doesn't actually have to mean physical contact. So if I'm at a store mm-hmm. or even if I'm like out in nature, we've already kind of talked about this, but what is the best thing I can do to protect myself? Number one, stay home if you don't feel well. That's that is, we have to start there. I think that's another thing that's so ingrained in our culture that you barrel through a cold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're just going to walk it off. Yeah. You know, and you're not going <laughs> to. Mm. <laughs> and There's... now it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to stay home today. And that's, I think it's, it's, it's oddly bizarre. Like my work just recently updated their, their health policy. And they're like, you know what? It used to be like, oh, if you feel okay to come to work, come to work. And now they're like, nope, you stay home. Yeah. If there's a better safe, mm-hmm. then sorry in this in this instance the second most important thing is the distance um at least six feet number three is this face covering that's making our you know making our uh, sound a little muffled these things don't look like much but we're finding out that they are incredibly impactful there are masks some some face coverings are certainly more effective than others some are less effective but all face coverings are better than no face coverings. So they're incredibly important. And then we can't forget the, what we were talking about so much at the beginning of this with hand hygiene, 
you know, mm -hmm. that can't slide either because we, we, there is that mode of, uh, possible mode of transmission too. So we have to keep washing our hands. Soap and water cannot be beat. That is the, that's the best, um, because it, it cleans as well as kills the virus. And then hand sanitizer is a good second if you can't wash. So those are the most important things for protecting yourself, when, like when you're in a store. And this one has kind of, we talked about staying home if you feel sick. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the earliest symptoms of COVID-19 that I should be thinking of? Yeah. Maybe like, oh, this is, this I should be concerned about and not just, oh, I woke up, um, I woke up with a slight headache because I didn't go to bed early enough yes. last night. What What is that symptom that, or the, the list of symptoms that we should be watching out for? Well, since it's a respiratory infection, many of the early symptoms are exactly what you'd think of when you hear a respiratory infection. So we're talking coughing, congestion, shortness of breath. It, you also need to have on your radar looking for fever or chills headaches, muscle pain, uh, sore throat, fatigue. And interestingly enough, the, a, a loss in the ability to smell and taste. Because this, while it is a respiratory virus, the, um, it attacks s systems all over your body. So it's not just breathing, it's, um, it impacts the gastrointestinal system as well. Oh. So if you wake up, and you feel nauseous, or you, you're yeah, vomiting or having diarrhea, that needs to, to send off some alert bells too. Don't necessarily assume that it was something you ate last night. It, this can, those can be symptoms too. So any of those symptoms warrant a call to Salt Tooth Mountain Clinic. Call and talk to one of our triage nurses and they will help you analyze and walk through and decide what your next steps need to be. And I, I have a I have a follow up question really mm -hmm. quick. What tests are currently being done? Is it the deep nose swab? Is it the because there's a few different ones. That's that as far as I know, that's they do the yeah the the, the, <laughs> the deep, deep nose swab. <laughs> you don't it, want the, that. So my advice is don't. So wear a mask, <laughs> wear a and, mask. and avoid getting yeah avoid getting that. It's not it's very quick. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't hurt it's just not super fun yeah so i i um actually i've had to have it done and um it was surprising i did not realize that there was that much space behind my nose i yeah. didn't realize how like, far oh. that thing could go it's it's doable it just if you can avoid it yeah. uh, just wear a mask yeah. wear a mask yeah. but if you need it get, get it. it done for sure because the not only do we want you to be okay but we want everyone that's around you to mm -hmm. be okay if everybody that was infectious suddenly developed you know the 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 word their freckles spelled out covid across <laughs> their forehead instantly then we'd all be okay but there's no way to know yeah. who is infected and who is not and that there's, I think there's, there's a, there's a scariness and a sadness around that too, because we are wired to, to want to come together, to want to be together and to have, and, and that togetherness is what supports us through scary times. But that wiring is also what puts us at risk. And the testing, I think, well, it's absolutely important. I don't want it to get for people to develop a false sense of security. Oh, I got tested on last, last Wednesday. And now, so that means I can go see grandma on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, even if you got your, you got your, your test results back before you go see grandma and it says you're negative. All that tells you is that that's a snapshot mm -hmm. at that moment. What has happened? in the meantime? And have you been exposed in the meantime? You don't know. Yeah. So, unless you're staying home. Unless you're, yeah, unless you, unless you are locked down. Yeah, the testing is absolutely important. And in a, if 
the, if medical personnel suggest that you get one, then you should mm -hmm. completely get one because, because that will help us contain this. But don't then let that make you think. Um, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. I can just do whatever. And we also don't know if immunity is a thing right now. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've seen so many people say, I'm not going to wear a mask because I've already had it, so I'm fine. Well, we don't know. We don't know. There's so much that we don't know that we, we have to just, okay, what do we know? And we have to do the best we can with that. And we, so we don't know how long immunity lasts. And we're learning too, because, you know, back in March, they said, don't wear masks. And I know a lot of people fall back on that. They're like, oh, but they told us not to wear masks then. It's like, well, we learned something exactly. new. Exactly. That's a really good point. This is a novel coronavirus and novel means it's new. Yeah. And so we're going to be learning. And the, the reason that we didn't want to, you know, that masking was not a thing early on was we needed to save the masks mm -hmm. for the, the medical personnel. And we didn't know if homemade masks were going to cut it or not. But now we know better, so we do better. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we'll learn more and we'll continue to refine the suggestions that, that we have, the guidance that's given. We'll continue to change a little bit. And that's, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing because it means that we're, we are, we're, we're getting things maybe a little more figured out. So it's, it's going to continue to change. You know, and people, I, I've, I've also gotten the question like, well, you know, shouldn't they know by now? I mean, this has been going on now for months. It's like research on these things takes years. years. Yeah. I mean, we didn't figure out the flu overnight. No. And we, we still, I think there's certain aspects about the flu that are still kind of being learned as we go. Yeah. And that's been around for hundreds of years now yeah so no it's it the the research is moving at breakneck speed um but there is there's so much that we don't know we have to do the best we can with what we do know and what we do know is that the majority of transmission comes between people that are within six feet of each other for more than 15 minutes so if we can right there if that's what we focus our energy on and we can tamp that down as much as we can we're going to go a long way mm -hmm. to 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 helping slow things down while we can while the the researchers are doing what they can do on the other end so wear a mask wear masks spend time with your family yep and enjoy the great outdoors yes Just be outside while we can it's you know and we can and we're fortunate um even even when it's cold and snowy lots of us are able to get outside winter is coming i don't want to actually think about that right now because it's so, <laughs> it's, so it's so beautiful so beautiful but um outside is a good place to be and we can be outside in four seasons here in minnesota so outside's better than inside small groups are better than big groups Big open spaces are better than small enclosed spaces. There is still joy to be had yes. in, in this time. And there is there are lots of ways that we can support each other in this and enjoy each other's company. Um, it's a scary time, but we don't have to live in fear. Yeah. This is uh, COVID-19 can't spread itself. We have to do its dirty work. And so the fo following safety guidelines is a, I think a way to take back control. Sometimes it feels like we've lost so much control, but taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other, that's where our control lies. And we, when we do this, we, we really can outsmart this virus that needs us. I like that to way of thinking, outsmarting it. Yeah. Be smarter than it. <laughs> yeah, we can be smarter, we can be more compassionate, and we can still be together. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time yeah. today. I really appreciate this it. This was a pleasure, Jay. Thank, thank you. you. I just thought of the mail song from Blue's Clues. The We Just Got a Letter song? No, the Here's the Mail. Oh, it yeah. never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it, like, why is that in my head right now? I should probably go check my mailbox. <laughs>
<laughs> when was the last time you checked your mail? Did you know that we have a P.O. box? Like, we do. Our office has a P.O. box. We do? Yeah. People I send don't, me snacks. I don't know last time we checked it, though. We should so probably it's, do that. We should probably do that. I don't know there which one it is. There should be, like, an ex, like, a little section of random things Martha says. We'll have a special episode someday. I have I have an entire like folder of recording episodes with Joe. Or I'm like, okay, we're I know I have something saved in there. Like, uh, I was creeping through like the O drive, and it was like Joe has to Joe has, Joe to, has pee. to pee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, God. We had no joke. <laughs> we would sit down. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start recording. And he would go, I have to pee. Hold on, I have to pee. And he would get up and go away. I'm like, why didn't you do that? And it's it's always at the beginning of a recording. And I have five or six. Like, who wants to, don't, don't you have a lot of like, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Yes, we have that too. Is, is it, are you going to be the first person or am I going to be the first person? I just let you start. I'm like, I I'm, think, yeah. I'm going to let you do it. I'll just chime in there with all my weird comments. We are a little more in sync then, well, because you know, it was back in the beginning, and we're like, okay, how are we, how's this podcast going to sound? Now I feel like we're just, let's just chat for a little bit, and then we'll get into the topic, and then we'll chat a little bit more. So as you can tell, um, thank you for staying to the end of the episode and listening to the full uh, interview with Hartley. I hope you found it informative and interesting and loved her as much as I love her. I love Hartley. Thank you so much, Hartley, for being on the podcast and for sharing your wisdom and for just being awesome and taking the time to do that. And again, this has been the uh, stand-up paddleboard slash how to come up to the North Shore and enjoy your time outside in a way that is safe. And I'm, I'm using air quotes around the word safe, by the way, because that's an interesting word to use because I feel like you can be... <laughs> You can safe be unsafe and not in any be safe, safe and you can be unsafe but still being safe. I don't know. It's it's a weird it's a weird world we live in. Yes. But we're gonna wrap this up now because you've heard us and you heard Martha sing, which was also very interesting. <laughs> I saw a baby Yoda that I wanted to get you the other day. Okay, another weird random thing that Martha <laughs> Well, I was in my room like office things. Like our office is really boring right now. Oh, I have a baby Yoda picture to go on my wall. I just have to bring it in. Oh, it's like a desk thing. Oh, okay. I'll take that. Because I wanted to get because you're team baby Yoda and I am I'm team, baby, team Yoda. baby Groot. Yes. And I don't think baby Yoda is cuter than baby Groot. I'm sorry. I just think baby Yoda has See, like you get an every, attitude and I love um, him. Have you I it? know baby Groot has an attitude too. <laughs> yeah. okay. Teenage Groot. You know what? Maybe if you feel like chiming in here, who's better, baby Yoda, baby Groot? I don't know why <gasps> this came up. Can we do that? Let's make a poll. Okay. Team baby Yoda or team baby Groot? We'll put it on our Facebook page. Check us out. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We are Exploring the North Shore. And this has been Exploring the North Shore with Martha and Jay. (laughs) 